All right, we are back, and we have a pretty loaded card here. Uh, there are 15 fights at the time of recording this, and uh, not a ton of name value, but uh, there are quite a few good matchups and a uh, few opportunities to make some money here. Like usual, I will be recapping the previous event before we dive into this event. So, uh, yeah, let's get right into it. Uh, taking a look at the props first. Uh, I put a quarter of a unit on Oleg Jacek, uh, first round knockout, and also a uh, 0.15 unit on Bukowski's round three knockout. The reason I did that, I felt that Oleg Jacek might start out strong, and, uh, you know, if he d didn't get uh, Bukowski's out of there, he might gas out, and uh, Bukowski's might get that late late round finish uh, like he like he has shown to do in uh, some of his regional events. Obviously that didn't happen. Both guys paced themselves pretty well and you know the fight went the full three rounds. Moving on, uh, I also did put a uh, 0.1 unit on uh, Jared Gooden to win by TKO round three. I thought that uh, how the fight would play out was Nurmagomedov would use his grappling early and might tire himself out, leading to a Gooden round three knockout. But uh, Nurmagomedov showed really good striking against Gooden and was able to strike with the most of that fight. But uh, yeah, just a 0.1 unit, obviously that didn't pan out as well. And then I also did put uh, 0.1 unit on uh, Almeida by knockout and 0.1 unit on Woodley by knockout. Obviously, neither of those happened, but I just felt that if those guys were to win, it would have been uh, by knockout. Uh, obviously, Almeida never really even came close. Uh, I was kind of banking on, you know, the light kicks a little bit. Um, obviously, you can't just bank on, you know, a fighter getting hurt, so that's why I only put 0.1 unit there. And then uh, with the Woodley fight, I thought that, you know, I, I didn't think that Woodley would be as passive as he usually was and given Luke's fight style there would be plenty of opportunities for Luke to or for uh, Woodley to land a bomb and you know Woodley I think surprised a lot of people when he started off aggressive and you know he actually threw so you know good showing on Woodley's part uh, although you know that chin on Luke is legendary super cast iron and uh, it's going to be hard fading Luke I know he takes a lot of damage in every fight but you know his chin is held up every single fight so I don't think I'm going to be fading him anytime soon and lastly for the props I did put 0.1 unit on uh, Barrio to win in either round two or round three by knockout I just felt that uh, with the Zaitar you know he's coming off a really long layoff and he's always had you know gas tank issues I just felt that after the first round uh, his cardio wasn't going to hold up and uh, it played out exactly the way I thought it would and uh, Barrio ended up did getting that uh, knockout late in the third round. I honestly thought that, you know, the fight could have been stopped a little earlier in the third round. But, you know, I'll take it as it is. I uh, did uh, win 1.4 units off that single bet. And that single-handedly uh, put me in the, in, the, in the green for the prop plays. And uh, going to the straight picks, I did uh, take Marc-Andre Barrio over at Azatar, like I, you know, said in the props there. Um, he did get the win there. Uh, that fight played out exactly like I thought it would. Uh, Shane Young, I ended up putting a half a unit on him. I didn't go over it on this podcast last week, but uh, I did go over that on my DraftKings podcast. I just felt that Morales had, you know, just really low output. He's the better striker. And, you know, I thought that Young, if he went to his grappling a bit, he could grind out a decision. Obviously, I wasn't super confident in that, which is why I only put half a unit, but I just felt the line was a little wide. And, you know, for most of the fight, it did look like Shane Young, Shane Young was in there. Morales, you know, he did end up getting the decision, but I don't think that was a particularly terrible play. Um, I did put a unit on Jillian Robertson, like I said. Uh, I thought that her grappling, or she would be able to go to her grappling a little more, but uh, the strength disparity was just far too big. And, you know, the striking disparity was, was really big there, too. And then uh, Miocic versus Nganu. I ended up putting a one and a half unit on uh, Miocic. I, in hindsight, it wasn't that great of a play. Obviously, you know, Francis came in there. Great game plan, great wrestling. And uh, he paced himself really well. And I know someone made a comment on the previous video about this. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, uh, you know, it was a good call there. And, you know, throughout fight week, I was starting to question it quite a bit. Uh, the narrative was, you know, obviously Miocic would be able to replicate what he did, but... Uh, yeah, I started feeling less and less confident about that because, again, you know, he is getting a bit older. And, you know, on uh, Nganu's end, he's the one that has, is making adjustments. He's the one that's improving. But uh, not too upset about it. Might have probably just put uh, a little bit less on it, or I should have probably put a little bit less on it to begin with. But uh, it is what it is. Um, and then taking a look at some of the other plays that did hit, uh, Michael Oleg Jacek and Modestus Bukowskis. Uh, I did put two units on Oleg Jacek. 
I thought that he would have a, a much more uh, clear advantage on the feet, but I think the size advantage was giving Oleg Jacek some problems. He was having a bit of uh, trouble closing the distance on Bukowskis, and you know he wasn't able to do as much damage as I'd liked, and that was a really, really hairy fight, and I'm glad he did get the decision, but... Yeah, I think uh, Oleg Jacek, he might have to move down if, you know, he's going to have continued success. And uh, taking a look at the other one, lastly, is uh, Jimmy Malarkey, comma worthy. Uh, did put one unit on Malarkey. Uh, did the fight play out the way I expected it to? Uh, not really. Um, I wasn't completely surprised, though, that he got the knockout. Worthy is a bit chinny. He has been knocked out, I believe, like six other times. I just thought that Malarkey would use a bit more of his grappling, but I wasn't completely surprised that, you know, he got the knockout there. Although, you know, I'll take it as it is. So overall, I did profit 1.57 units on the night and then uh, ended up going six out of eight correct uh, as far as, you know, just picks go. So uh, yeah, that'll do it for the recap. And uh, let's dive right into this card. And to kick the card off, we have Impa Kasanganai versus uh, Sasha Polotnikov. And uh, taking a look at the odds real quick here, we have uh, Kasaganai, the minus 300 favorite, and the comeback on Polotnikov is plus 250. And uh, let's start with Kasanganai here, who is a pretty well-rounded fighter, in my opinion. Uh, you know, he's got good offensive and defensive striking. Um, he is a little hittable, though, when, you know, in the, in the pocket, but, you know, he's also got a decent clinch game. And he's got pretty solid wrestling, too. And, you know, I mean this all in relative terms. I mean, he's not elite or anything, but for someone who is still pretty green, pretty early in their UFC career, I'd say, you know, he's developed those parts of his game pretty well. He's also pretty young, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him make a lot of improvements in between each fight. Yeah, like he's only uh, only 27, so yeah, plenty of room for improvement. And, uh, you know, outside of that head kick that he ate from Buckley, he's proven to be pretty durable. I mean, he was taking some pretty heavy shots from Pitolo and Buckley, and, uh, you know, he's got a lot of power on his end, too. He's not super high volume or anything, but, you know, he is really composed in there. We'll pick his shots and, uh, you know, stay safe in there, and we'll mix it up and really just take the fight to wherever he's most comfortable. And taking a look at his opponent, Polotnikov, uh, I kind of took a shit on him in his last fight, and, you know, I still don't think that he's UFC caliber at all. I think what really won him that fight in the in his UFC debut was really just his toughness. I mean, he ate the, the best shots from Koski and, you know, was able to weather the storm there. And in hindsight, it probably wasn't a bad idea to let them keep fighting. But, you know, the inconsistency with some of the refereeing is just really annoying since, you know, in, in a lot of other fights, you would potentially see a stoppage there. But, you know, he did let uh, Polotnikov fight his way back and Koski ended up just completely gassing himself going forward in that first round, and that allowed uh, Polotnikov to just kind of tee off on Koski. Koski was essentially just a punching bag outside of outside of that first three and a half minutes. So I don't really think we've seen much from Polotnikov at this point still. There wasn't a ton of tape on him before that anyways, and you know, from what I've seen, he isn't super high level. He'll look to maybe just control opponents, but I really don't see much in his striking that I like, and you know, in this matchup, I don't think that Kasanganai is really going to look to, you know, blow his load on him. He's going to be really composed, really measured in there, and look to just pick at Polotnikov in there. But taking a look at this matchup, I think that Kasanganai just has Polotnikov beat everywhere. I mean, in, as far as the striking goes, I think uh, Kasanganai is going to be the more technical striker. He's going to be the one that hits a bit harder. And then as far as the grappling goes, he'll be the stronger guy in there. I think he's got a more diverse, you know, skill set as well. So I think this is a pretty tough match for uh, Polotnikov, who, you know, if you kind of just look through his record as well, he hasn't really fought the best opponents. He's fought, you know, on a pretty low-level regional scene, fighting against really low-level guys. And, you know, in that Koski fight, like I was saying, you know, his toughness was really what won him that fight and not so much his, uh, not so much his skill. So this will be a pretty tough fight for him. I think Kasanganai takes it. I think that, you know, he'll be landing the, the harder shots in a lot of the striking exchanges. He'll probably be landing the cleaner shots as well. And if he does decide to clinch up with Polotnikov or take him down, I don't think he'll have too much trouble with that. He's going to be the much stronger guy in there. So, yeah, I got Kasanganai here. I'm not sure if I'll bet it yet. The, the line seems a little bit wide, but, I mean, at the same time, it does definitely feel justified, but... You know, we haven't really seen enough tape on Polotnikov to completely write him off yet. I just don't think that he's quite at that level. And Kasanganai is coming off of a pretty nasty head kick. And, you know, it's only been about six months. So 
there definitely is a little bit of concern as to whether you know he's fully recovered from that or not. But um, you know he's a young guy, so he most likely has. But you know just a, a few red flags there, and you know this is just a little wide for my taste. I might look to put him in a few parlays. But overall, I, I just think that there are a few better spots on the card. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna pick uh, Kasangani here, but uh, I'm probably not gonna bet it. William Knight versus Da Eun Jung, and Knight was initially scheduled to fight Menefield, and if you listened to my podcast before, I was all over Menefield. I just really don't think that Knight is that good at all. He's not very technical, and he does just rely a lot on his power to win his fights, but uh, taking a look at the odds real quick, uh, Knight is uh, the plus 105 underdog, and Jung is a uh, slight favorite at minus 125. But back to what I was saying about Knight. I mean, on the feet, he's just not very skilled, very plotty. He keeps his hands low. Uh, he's very slow, telegraphs his shots, and, uh, you know, he does have a, a nice heavy leg kick that he uses, which, you know, could be kind of effective against someone like Jung, who does stand he- a bit heavy on his lead leg. Although, uh, you know, his stri- the, the striking of Knight is just, I'm not really impressed by it at all. And his striking defense isn't great either. Keeps his head on the center line, keeps his chin out. And, you know, is very hittable. However, his fights are primarily won on the ground. He's an absolute tank and his top control is extremely smothering. But he doesn't even have the best takedowns. I mean, he relies really heavily on just muscling his opponents to the ground. And in a lot of his fights, I don't know why, but his opponents tend to just want to clinch up with him, get in close, you know, dirty box with him, when, you know, they're much better off just maintaining distance and just kind of picking at him. But like we saw in his fight with, you know, guy like uh, uh, William or Alexa Kamer, he uh, Kamer just kept looking to clinch up with them when it was very obvious that Knight had a very significant strength advantage, and uh, you know he kept looking to tie up with them even though Knight was consistently reversing positions. Uh, even taking him down and holding dominant positions, uh, Kamer just kept looking to tie up with them, even though he was having a lot of success on the feet. And, you know, that was just a very low IQ, very uh, terrible, you know, game planning on his end. But yeah, overall, I'm just not very high on Knight at all. I I think he just relies a bit too much on his strength and isn't very technical. And uh, taking a look at his opponent, Jung, uh, on the feet, I mean, I think he's got pretty good boxing. Nothing crazy, nothing to write home about, but, you know, he does stand a little heavy on his lead leg, has a a good one-two and a jab, and, uh, you know, uses his length pretty well and has uh, got decent uh, range management. But, I mean, he's not a super layered striker or anything, but for the sake of this matchup, I I do have to say he is going to be the better striker. I think he's uh, just much quicker on the feet and much, much more slick with his boxing. And as far as his grappling goes, I mean, we haven't really seen too much of it in the UFC. I've kind of had to dig a little bit into some of his regional tape to really see how good his takedown defense is, how good, you know, he is in scramble situations, you know, uh, if he's good at getting back up and, uh, you know, getting off his back. And uh, there wasn't too much I found on it. I mean, there were a few fights where it looked like his, you know, opponents were shooting for the double leg. And he had a decent sprawl and was good at controlling the head and, you know, was decent at scrambling. But I don't think any of those guys are really on the athletic level of Knight. And, you know, none of them were, none of them are as strong as Knight, obviously. But, um, yeah, those guys didn't really seem like like, uh, uh, grapple-heavy fighters either. So I wasn't able to get too much from it but it does seem like Jung you know he knows what to do in those situations I think if he is able to keep it standing though he wins a pretty comfortable fight I mean if I'm Jung just look to keep the fight at distance and look to just pump the jab out maybe you know throw a few of those one twos uh, look for the straight right and just look to avoid clinch situations and you know try not to get backed up Obviously, easier said than done, but I think this is a very winnable fight for Jung. So my pick here is Jung. I think that on the feet, he's got a pretty clear advantage. Uh, you know, I took Menefield in that fight before because I really like the takedown defense of Menefield. And, you know, he was one of the only guys I think that would be able to match the strength of uh, a Knight. And, you know, the power he had on the feet was, you know, definitely a, a plus for him as well. But... You know, uh, as far as Jung goes, I think he's the much more technical striker. I think on the feet, um, yeah, he should be able to, to touch up Knight. It's just whether or not he could keep it uh, on the fu- on the feet long enough. And uh, I'm going to lead towards yes. Uh, I've already put 
one and a half units on him at minus 125. I think there's a good chance that he does keep it up on the feet long enough to to do damage to tonight to win the rounds. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a later finish in the fight, maybe, you know, later in round three. Um, Knight isn't really a gasser. I mean, he's uh, fought in a lot of grapple heavy fights and he doesn't seem to really tire much. He still still seems to bring the pressure, still is able to take his opponents down. But um, in this fight, if he isn't able to take Jung down, he might just take sustained damage. And, you know, over the course of three rounds, that could lead to just, you know, a, a knockout or a TKO uh, just from, you know, volume and damage over time. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's super likely he gets the knockout. I think more often than not, he will go to a, win a decision. So uh, I'm going to go with Jung by decision, but... Uh, I might put a little bit on Jung round three knockout. So, uh, yeah, the pick here is Jung, and uh, I am, or I do already have one and a half units on Jung at minus 125. Luis Saldana versus uh, Jordan Griffin. And uh, let's start with Saldana here. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. We don't have a ton of tape on him, so I don't really have too much to say on him. But uh, taking a look at the one fight that I did find tape on, and that was his uh, contender series fight against uh, Murdoch. Saldana, I mean, he's offensively, you know, pretty good in my opinion. Uh, very uh, flashy with his shots. Uh, picks his shots really well. I mean, he'll he'll look t- uh, for openings and really, you know, load up on his shots. Whether it's like a punch or a kick, he'll uh, put quite a bit of heat on it. And uh, something I, I noticed in that fight though was he threw a lot of spinning attacks, uh, lots of spinning back kicks, uh, uh, spinning back fists, and you know, he kept going to it too. So uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, he. Did win the fight, but uh, I don't know if, if the, the shot selection there was uh, too good. But, you know, overall, it did look like he had decent uh, range management, but, you know, really not a ton of tape on him otherwise. And, you know, Murdoch, he had a pretty consider- considerable uh, size advantage on him. So, you know, I can't really make too much of a read on him. It does look like he has good offensive striking, though. Don't really know much about his grappling. Uh, although, you know, from some of the highlights I've seen, he is a pretty aggressive fighter. Um, does look to get the finish in a lot of his fights. So, yeah, very aggressive. But outside of that, I really can't say much about him. And uh, taking a look at Griffin, I mean, he's good. He's got good offensive striking. But the issue is, uh, you know, all the, in all of his fights in the UFC, the guys just look to grapple with him. And, you know, just because just that's just such a massive hole in his game. So uh, in all of his fights, he's consistently out grappled. He's, you know, held down for considerable amounts of time. And, um yeah, his uh, fight IQ and or either his cardio is really questionable too because in a number of his fights, uh, particularly uh, the Chas Skelly fight, he was piecing Skelly up on the feet and decided to just shoot a takedown there where that was a, you know, it was a terrible idea because the only time that Skelly had any sort of success in that fight was when it was on the ground. And eventually he was you know, reversed and Skelly was able to mount you know, considerable amount of offense you know, on top and control him to end a lot of the rounds, which, you know, kind of, I'd say, looked really bad in the judge's eyes. And and really, that's just not a good look because, you know, I don't know why you'd be shooting the takedown unless, you know, he had really poor fight IQ or, you know, he was tired from throwing those shots and wanted to play it a little safe, take the fight to the ground. But, you know, you can't really do that when the other guy, or the only time the other guy's having success is when it's on the ground. So, um, you know, yeah, very, very concerning there. But, uh, as far as the striking go, I'd say it's pretty, he hits pretty hard and, you know, his offensive striking is actually pretty good, which, you know, I guess is why his opponents always look to take him down. But as far as this matchup goes, I think it's going to primarily be standing. Uh, I haven't really seen much from, uh, Saldana, so I don't know if he's got much of an offensive grappling game, but, um, from what I've seen in his last fight, he just looks like more of a, a stand-up guy, primarily a striker. I don't think, you know, even if he does have a bit of a wrestling game, it's not really, where he's strong at so I suspect this fight will largely stay standing um you know he might try and wrestle with uh Griffin just because that's probably going to be the you know path of least resistant for him but uh Griffin he does have a pretty nasty guillotine and I don't know if that's a situation you want to dive into if it's not your strong suit so yeah I don't know if Saldana is really going to look to want to wrestle uh, especially if he's not really conditioned to do so. So again, I'm pretty sure this will just be a stand-up fight. And uh, taking a look at the betting lines, because I think I forgot about that, but uh, Saldana, his minus 140 favorite comeback on Griffin is plus 120. And you know I don't really agree with that. I don't really see how Saldana is 
going to be the favorite here. I think from a you know striking perspective, I think they're pro- both going to be pretty evenly matched. I think both of these guys don't have great defensive striking. I think this will probably be a pretty uh, high pace. Well, not high pace, but I think it'll be a pretty back and forth striking battle. Um, it'll come out, you know, pretty even in my opinion. Uh, in which case, I think this should be more of like a pick'em fight. But you know, I do got to give the advan or the experience advantage to Griffin. You know, the, he has uh, a few more fights than uh, Saldana here. But as bad as Griffin has looked in the UFC so far, I, he still has the UFC advantage, and he has fought some, I'd say, UFC level guys. Whereas Saldana, I mean, he hasn't really fought anyone of note, in my opinion. And he's also had some really questionable losses on his record, too. Like, you know, if you're just flipping through his record here, he's got a loss to someone who's, who was 3-2 and two at the time, and Alex Wiggs, and then uh, another loss to, you know, Damian Childress at, you know, who was 1-1. One and one. So, uh, you know, this guy, he's losing to, to guys who are, have, you know, two or three fights in. So, you know, terrible, terrible look on his end. But, you know, offensively, his striking, you know, seems to be there. But, again, really low-level opponent, and you can't take too much from that performance. So... Uh, yeah, I'm going to pick Griffin here, but uh, I don't know if I'm going to bet it just yet. I'd like a little, you know, uh, better odds on uh, on Griffin before I take him, especially since he's had a pretty uninspiring run in the UFC. But uh, yeah, but something I actually am looking at is uh, the under one and a half and under two and a half, because I think both guys are going to start off pretty strong. Both guys are primarily strikers. And I think that if they get after it early, I think that someone's going to get knocked out. I mean, as it stands right now, the under one and a half is plus 290 and the under two and a half is plus 180. And man, I think this is kind of crazy because, yeah, I know, uh, you know uh, Griffin, he's had really an you know, uninspiring run in the UFC, but that's because he's been, he's been fighting guys like Zalal, TJ Brown, Chas Gelly, Dan Ige, all of these guys, um, you know, they're not like super strong wrestlers, but they are pretty well-rounded fighters who can go to their, you know, wrestling and uh, against someone like Griffin, who really has terrible takedown defense, terrible defensive grappling, they just took the path of least resistance. But in a lot of uh, Griffin's regional fights, the guys aren't as well-rounded, and they just opt to stand and strike with him, in which case, uh, you know, he's able to finish a lot of these guys, and a lot of uh, these low-level guys he's been able to get the job done with. I mean, if you kind of just look through some of his losses, uh, Yusuf Zalal, Chas Gelly, Dan Ige, Juan Archuleta, Dan Moret, I mean, all of these guys have made it to, you know, a higher level promotion like the UFC or Bellator. So uh, I got to at least credit Griffin where, you know, his losses are to at least, you know, higher caliber opponents. Whereas with Saldana, I I can't say the same. So uh, I really like this under one and a half and two and a half here. I think there's a good chance that the two and a half caches, um, possibly the one and a half too. Uh, I can see this fight definitely going a bit later into the second round, but uh, yeah, I think these guys are going to get after it. And, um, yeah, I, I think there's a really good chance that the under cash is. So I'm looking really heavily at that. And, uh, I might just end up putting a unit on, uh, the under one, two and a half, and then half a unit on the one and a half, uh, as soon as I'm done recording this. So, uh, the pick here is Griffin. And, uh, uh, as far as bets go, I'm looking at the, uh, the unders here. Jack Shore versus Hunter Azure. And a uh, pretty good fight here. Uh, taking a look at the odds. Uh, Shore is the minus 140 favorite, and the comeback on Azure is plus 120. And uh, let's start with Shore first. So uh, on the feet, you know, offensively, he's got, you know, decent striking. Uh, A good jab, 1-2, and a leg kick that he likes to throw, although that's primarily just to keep busy and not so much to look to hurt his opponent or anything. I mean, uh, you know, overall, his offensive striking isn't anything crazy, nothing that'll really blow you away. It's definitely something he could work on but you know it is serviceable and you know he is primarily a grappler so he ultimately does want to get it to the ground but it is serviceable to the point where he doesn't have to telegraph his takedowns and you know his opponent isn't you know expecting him to shoot a takedown right away so uh yeah and uh defensively i mean he's good at keeping a high guard and does have decent head movement so, you know, I'd say overall defensively, he is, uh, you know, pretty defensively sound there. Uh, but again, his bread and butter really is his grappling. He's got good timing on his level change. Uh, you know, will cage push and look to get trips along the fence. And when he's on the ground, he's got good top control. And, you know, he's got a pretty good guard pass and transitions. And, you know, we saw in this fight against Hernandez, you know, he was able to pass the guard pretty quickly. 
and was able to take his back on uh, multiple occasions there. And uh, that is something I do want to touch on as well with uh, Shore. You know, in a number of his fights, he's really proficient on the ground. And a lot of the times he's able to just uh, get the back of his opponent and uh, go for that rare naked choke of his. And taking a look at his opponent, Hunter Azure, he's, you know, he likes to swing big on the feet. Very, uh, you know, he's kind of aggressive. Uh, he, he will look to headhunt a bit. But, you know, everything he throws, he throws with, you know, a lot of power behind it. You know, big overhand, big hooks, big uppercuts, you name it. And, you know, he can definitely hurt you if it lands. But if he doesn't, he does use up a lot of energy. And we have seen in a number of his fights, he starts to slow down a decent amount, you know, after that first round. And then by the time that third round comes around, he's, uh, I mean, he's not completely gassed, but his output kind of wanes quite a bit. Uh, his shots, you know, they're not as... They don't have as much power, and they come out a little slower. And you know he's not he's not winging those those power shots later in the fight. So uh, he's definitely not as dangerous going into the second and third round. But you know in that first round, I do give him a, a bit of an edge because again that's when he's got the most power. And uh, as far as his grappling goes, uh, he does have you know pretty good offensive wrestling, but uh, we haven't seen him really use it too much. Uh, I think it's partially because you know uh, he's got some cardio issues and he doesn't want to use all of his cardio on you know the wrestling uh, he probably just wants to you know stick to the striking and use his uh, wrestling really just to uh, just to keep the fight from getting to the ground but as far as his defensive grappling goes he's got a first or he's got a good uh, first level of defense for um, his takedown defense you know it's it's solid there but uh, I have seen him struggle quite a bit, you know, when he's backed up against the cage. He's given up, you know, significant control time there and, you know, isn't really good at kind of breaking away from the clinch. Uh, we've seen in a number of his fights where he's, yeah, given up significant, you know, time, you know, along the fence or just uh, in, uh, in the clinch. And if he isn't able to get out of those situations against Shore, there's a, a good chance that Shore is able to just kind of wear him out for a few rounds and uh, eventually get the takedown on him because, uh, you know, sure, he's got he's got pretty solid takedown, good trips. And, uh, yeah, if he's going to just hang in the clinch in there with uh, Shore, then, you know, it's going to give him plenty of opportunities to get this fight to the ground. That said, though, uh, Azure is a pretty strong dude. And, you know, he's got decent takedown defense. So taking him down won't be easy. But, you know, I think as the fight goes on, as he starts to tire a bit, the takedowns will be or they will come a little easier for uh, sure. So th that's kind of how I see the fight playing out. Um, I, uh, you know, the first round we might see a bit more striking from both guys, but you know, as the fight progresses, maybe later in the first round or, you know, at the start of the second, third round, we'll start to see sure really lay it on with like the, the wrestling. Um, I don't know if he wants to keep it, you know, standing for too long. Shore's got, you know, his, his standup is serviceable, but if it is purely a, a striking fight, it's, he's going to be in a lot of trouble because, uh, his, his striking isn't that great, and Azure, you know, he's got some power, so Shore will start to fall behind in these prolonged striking exchanges. But with the way Azure sometimes, you know, wings those hooks of his, you know, he gets he overextends on them, and that will leave plenty of opportunities for Shore to, you know, get, uh, hit a level change and just get the takedown that way. So I do eventually see Shore getting this. Uh, fight to the ground and uh, I definitely see him at least winning two rounds with the grappling um, I think that first round might be a little close but going into that second and third round when uh, Azure starts to tire a bit I definitely do see Shore being able to you know get to get to work on the ground there so yeah that's kind of how I see the fight playing out as far as you know bets go uh, I have already put one and a half units on Shore at minus 140 uh, I think there's a decent amount of value on him still and uh, once the, the betting lines or the uh, the props open up a bit, I, I do look to maybe put like a, a little bit on uh, Shore round three submission just because uh, I think that Azure does slow down a bit. He does have, you know, suspect cardio and going into the, the later round, I think that the the takedowns will come a bit easier for Shore and he's not going to have too much issue passing the guard of Azure and eventually taking his back. I think more often than not, if Shore were to win, uh, it would be by decision. But uh, I do think there is a decent chance that he is able to get the submission late there, especially as uh, Azure starts to tire. So uh, the pick here for me is uh, Shore, and I do have one and a half units put on, on uh, Shore here, and I do intend on putting a little bit on Shore round three submission.
Jarjus Danho versus Jorgen De Castro, and I'm not very interested in this fight at all from, you know, as a, as a fan and, you know, from a betting perspective. But uh, speaking of, uh, taking a look at the line here, De Castro is going to be a minus 280 favorite and the comeback on Danho is plus 240. And let's start with Danho first. Uh, I mean, there's not much to say. The guy's a 37-year-old. He's got eight professional fights. One of them was a no contest. And, you know, he's coming off of a four-year layoff. Doesn't really have, you know, a decent skill set or anything. So, you know, there's really no reason to want to take this guy. But at the same time, you know, he's going against Jorgen De Castro, who, you know, is a bit younger, but he's still, he's 33, you know. I know this is heavyweight, but, you know, at 33, you know, how, how many improvements are you really making? But, uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't really been impressed with De Castro either. But as far as, you know, what Danho does... He's really just likes to throw that overhand bomb. He, he spams the shit out of that quite a bit. And, you know, he will look to clinch up with the opponents too, but I really have not seen much from Danho that is, you know, impresses me at all or gives me any confidence to pick him. And, you know, he's coming off of a draw, but that could very easily have been lost if it wasn't for the point deduction. Uh, granted, he did eat a very clean knee to the dome when he was downed, supposedly. You know, he had his, like, fingertips on the, the mat there. And, you know, in 2021, he probably could have gotten a, a DQ win there. But, you know, this was back in late 2016. So, yeah, he's coming off of a, a draw. And it's pretty obvious what the UFC wants to do with him, right? Like, he's been booked against Greg Hardy and Tuivasa. So it seems like they want to just kind of feed him to some, some prospects. And none of those fights went through. And, you know, now he's getting... Fed to De Castro, who in my opinion isn't that great at all, like I was saying. But yeah, De Castro striking not really good. Uh, I mean, he did was he was able to catch Tafa early in that fight, but outside of that, you know, he's not really shown much. He's got a decent leg kicking game, but you know, when his striking isn't really working for him, he'll look to just clinch up with the opponents and just look to kind of stall. And that's that's not really how you win. And you know, against someone like Danho, who is pretty strong himself and likes to clinch up. This has the making of being a really boring, you know, clinch-heavy fight with a lot of cage pushing, you know, if uh, if uh, De Castro isn't able to get Danho out of there or if Danho isn't able to land one of those bombs. That being said, though, I wouldn't be surprised if Danho just got caught coming in with one of those bombs because it's pretty telegraphed and, uh, yeah, it's, he's kind of slow too. And, you know, with that long layoff, uh, I'm, I'm not, it doesn't look too good for him. But I really just don't have any confidence in Castro, De Castro to be uh, laying minus 280 on him. So uh, I'm going to pick him. I think that, you know, if the fight, you know, he is, if anyone's going to get anyone out of there, I think it's, you know, De Castro is going to be the one getting the knockout. And, uh, you know, he could potentially grind out a decision too, but uh, not super confident in him. Uh, yeah, I'll go with him, but uh, I'm not going to touch this fight from a betting perspective. John McDessey versus... Ignacio Bahamondes and uh, let's take a look at the odds real quick here so Bahamondes is the minus 190 favorite and the comeback on McDessey is plus 165 and uh, let's take a look at uh, the newcomer Bahamondes first so uh, just a second here all right so yeah Bahamondes uh, offensively, yeah, it looks really good, very sharp, uh, very good mixed attack, and, you know, he has a very flashy striking style, lots of spinning attacks, and I uh, did see him throw, like, an axe kick in one of his fights, so, uh, you know, very fun to watch offensively, very high work rate, and uh, is able to switch stances pretty well in there, so, um, yeah, I mean, I really like what I see from this guy, you know, he's good defensively, um, has good head movement, but, uh, you know, I've seen him get clipped quite a bit when he's uh, in uh, boxing range. However, I'd say overall, he's got really solid, you know, offensive boxing and, uh, you know, he's looked good so far. Uh, the only knock I really have on him is uh, his uh, lack of experience, really. And, uh, you know, he hasn't really fought anyone of note. And taking a look at his opponent, uh, John McDessey, I mean, as far as experience goes, this guy, I'd say he is a veteran of the sport. Uh, he's fought a number of guys in the division. Uh, you know, like Venada, Trinaldo, and uh, Yancy Medeiros, Donald Cerrone. So uh, a few names in the division, although that was back in the day. He is uh, has been re relatively inactive recently. Really been only taken like, it uh, looks like one fight a year here. Um, but, you know, as far as his offense goes, uh, you know, he's not really a, a high-paced fighter. He's a bit more of a, a point fighter, lots of movement on the feet, um, pretty defensively sound, but you know, he doesn't have a ton of power or anything. Uh, we'll look to kind of just point fight, honestly. You know, kick at his opponents, jab at them. Um, 
That said, though, uh, it's it's great against, I guess, lower level guys and guys who aren't as technical. But something to consider is uh, McDessie, you know, he is 35. He's starting to get up there in age. And, you know, at uh, at lightweight, that's that's kind of old. And uh, I think his age and his athleticism is uh, or the, his athleticism is going to start to decline. Uh, he's you know, he's never really been a power puncher either. So. Uh, yeah, this is not a not a great matchup for him, in my opinion. I feel that Bahamondes should be able to win this, but uh, I'm not super confident in it because, you know, like I said before, Bahamondes, he's still really young, pretty green, and as for as good as he's looked, it's been against pretty low-level opponents. And as far as what Mcdesi is good at, he is pretty defensively sound, and, you know, he is good at kind of punishing opponents when they're coming in, looking to counter-strike, and really just accruing points with his, you know, leg kicks and jabs and one-twos, but I think what it'll really come down to is who's pressuring and who's dictating the pace. I think that if uh, Bahamundes is the one moving forward and, you know, pressuring Mcdesi, I think he'll have a lot of success. Because from what we've seen so far with McDessey, when he's on his back foot and circling out, he has a much harder time getting his offense going. And uh, I can say the same about Bahamundas too. So if McDessey is able to just back Bahamundas down, he can make this a pretty close fight. And uh, Bahamundas does stand a bit heavy on his uh, lead leg occasionally. And, you know, it's going to be open for the leg kicks of McDessey. And with the, the long legs of Bahamundas, I think that's going to be a very uh, accessible target for McDessey here. And honestly, I think McDessie is a pretty boring fighter, and uh, I hope he loses, but uh, it's, I think he could definitely make this a much closer fight than the line would imply. Uh, so, uh, you know, I am going to have to go with Bahamundes here. I think his, you know, striking attack much more varied. He has a lot more uh, options when it comes to what he wants to do offensively. And, uh, you know, it's, if it goes to a decision, I think that, you know, if he's the one pressuring, you know, he's the one throwing, like, the flashier attacks, that I think that is going to have... Uh, an impact on the judges scoring. So uh, I'm going to go with Bahamundas here, but I don't know if I'll bet him mainly because uh, I think he still needs to, to prove himself a little more. And, uh, you know, unless McDessie's completely fallen off a cliff athletically, he can definitely make this a, a closer fight than uh, the line would imply. So yeah, the pick here is uh, Bahamundas, but uh, I'm not looking to bet this fight yet. Norma Dumont versus... Aaron Blanchfield, and Blanchfield is actually coming in short notice for this fight. Uh, Dumont was originally scheduled uh, to face off against Bea Malecki, which uh, I had actually already done the recording for, but uh, whatever, I had to retape this. Um, but taking a look at Norma Dumont first, I mean, uh, there wasn't too much tape on her. Uh, her striking, you know, it is a bit clunky, uh, although, you know, I do have to say she does seem to have pretty heavy hands. Pretty good combination striking, and uh, you know I've seen her throw like three or four punch combos. She will go to her you know clinch game a bit, but uh, you know overall I'd say she is a little slow, a little plotty. Not that it'll matter too much. I mean I don't think that at this level it's gonna matter like uh, too much. She's probably gonna have a lot of success with her striking regardless, uh, since this is pretty low level women's MMA. Um, but yeah, I mean taking a look at some of her previous fights, she was able to just. I'd say pretty handily dominate Ashley Evan Smith. And uh, for parts of that Megan Anderson fight, I'd actually say she looked decent. But uh, she ended up eating just a clean, clean right cross in that fight, right on the button, sat her down. And, you know, I was saying earlier how inconsistent some of the refereeing is. Like, I felt this fight was a bit of an early stoppage. You know, seeing how some of the other fights, they just let him recover and, you know, get back into it. Uh, this was one of those fights where as soon as she got sat down, uh, she wasn't even out or anything. She got, you know, the fight got waved off. But yeah, just uh, kind of frustrated with the inconsistency here. But uh, it is what it is. And uh, going back to this matchup, uh, let's go over Blanchfield first. I mean, next. So uh, taking a look at Blanchfield, uh, you know, she's, you know, usually fighting at 125. So that's the first thing I do want to know. Uh, she's making a short notice uh, debut here and will be fighting at 135 against a pretty big Norma Dumont who, you know, usually fights at 145, uh, was supposed to be fighting at 135 her last fight, but actually missed weight by, I believe, four pounds. So uh, she's going to be at a, a size disadvantage, but uh, taking a look at her striking, I'd say, you know, she's still pretty green herself. However, I'd say she is pretty tenacious, pretty aggressive with her striking, uh, and then defensively, it looks like she relies a bit on her head movement uh, to evade shots, 
And it does look like she has a bit of a grappling game as well, but um, I haven't seen her really been able to control opponents too successfully, and I've seen opponents like scramble out of there. But man, as far as this matchup goes, I think it's going to be a pretty tough match for Blanchfield, because like I was saying earlier, uh, she's coming in short notice and will be giving up quite a bit of size. Dumont is going to have a pretty clear strength advantage. And, you know, as far as how the striking is going to play out, I think that uh, Dumont is going to be able to come out ahead on a lot of the exchanges. Uh, I think that she'll be landing a bit harder. And, you know, I think her shots are just going to be overall uh, much more impactful. And, you know, neither of these women really have great striking defense. So this could be a very back and forth fight on the feet. But I think what will help Dumont pull ahead is really the strength and, uh, you know, her, you know, combination striking. I think overall she will come out pretty clearly ahead. I think that, you know, over the course of, you know, three rounds, uh, Blanchfield is going to be wearing the damage a lot more. And, you know, we saw in her fight against, or uh, Dumont's fight against Evan Smith where, you know, she was absolutely touching her up and uh, she actually busted her up pretty badly. And uh, I see the same happening to Blanchfield here who, you know, she's got very uh, porous defense. And as far as the grappling goes, uh, I think that, you know, Dumont being the much stronger fighter here uh, will have the advantage there as well. I think that if the striking isn't going her way, she can just look to clinch up with Blanchfield, maybe look to take her down and control her there. However, what I will say about Blanchfield is, uh, you know, she'll probably be the faster fighter in there. And uh, she actually has the reach advantage even though she is going to be the shorter fighter. So, uh, yeah, uh, Blanchfield, she's 5'4 and has a 68-inch reach, while uh, Dumont is 5'7 and has a 67-inch uh, reach. But, you know, I don't think that'll play too much of a factor in there. Uh, I don't think she's just going to be, like, sticking and moving in there. I don't know if she'll completely, you know, just utilize her range uh, effectively in this fight. I think this will just be a, a pretty kind of, you know, back-and-forth, brawly sort of fight on the feet. But yeah, as far as a pick goes, I am going to take Dumont here. I think she wins pretty comfortably. And uh, I'm probably going to catch some flack for this, but uh, I'm very tempted to put a little bit on uh, Dumont here because I just really have a hard time seeing Blanchfield winning this. I think, you know, if she comes in super aggressive and is looking to scrap, she might make this close, uh, a close stand up fight. But. I think that more often than not, Dumont's going to come out ahead in the striking with, uh, you know, just the power advantage and likely the volume advantage. Um, and then if she does do, does decide to look to grapple, I think that, you know, she'll have a pretty significant advantage there as well. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll see what other people are saying about this. You know, if you guys have any comments about this, let me know. Maybe talk me off the ledge here. But, yeah, I think, uh, I think Dumont wins pretty comfortably here and... Yeah, I think she wins at a pretty high clip. So uh, the pick here is Dumont. And uh, if I can get her at minus 200, I might just take a stab on her. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. Mateus Gamrot versus Scott Holtzman. And uh, taking a look at the odds real quick, we have uh, Gamrot, the minus 227 favorite. Comeback on Holtzman is plus 192. And uh, let's start with the underdog Holtzman first. Um, so taking a look at his striking, I mean, uh, he's got decent offensive striking. He does load up quite a bit on his shots, but, you know, he's not really knocking anyone out. So, um, yeah, it does have quite a bit of power in his shots, but, you know, he's not really flooring anyone. So uh, definitely something to consider there. Overall, though, I'd say he's got a decent skill set. Um, you know, very meat and potatoes with his striking. Nothing flashy, uh, but, you know, he gets the job done. And, you know, he's got solid takedown defense. He's a really strong guy. He's got good hips. And, you know, he's pretty good at working his way back up. But, you know, he's, uh, there's a lot of red flags around him, in my opinion. And the reason I say that is because he's coming off of a pretty nasty knockout uh, from Dariush, uh, against Dariush. And, you know, he was actually taking a decent amount of damage, you know, going, uh, you know, before he got knocked out, before the spinning back fist landed on him. Like, uh, I think Dariush caught him with a pretty clean, like, uh, overhand right, I think it was. And he was eating a lot of headshots from Darius prior to the knockout. So, uh, yeah, a lot of damage taken in that fight. And, you know, I'd say he took a decent amount of damage against Jim Miller, too. And, you know, honestly, uh, that win didn't really age too well, considering, uh, you know, he took Jim Miller to, to a decision there. And, you know, Miller was, you know, giving him a bit of trouble throughout the fight. And, uh, you know, we know Jim Miller. He's primarily, you know, he's a, he's a one-round fighter at this point. And being able to take 
you know, Jim Miller decision is uh, not a not a great look. But uh, back to what I was saying, um, Holtzman, he's uh, he's a bit older. He's 37 now, coming off of a, a pretty nasty knockout. Uh, I think that you know his the, the wheels might be falling off here. And you know, at 155 or at lightweight, uh, again, that's a really old age to continue to be fighting at a pretty high level. So. I think that we're going to start to see a pretty steep decline for Holtzman in his upcoming fights. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to be the one. And, you know, up until his most recent fight, he has been pretty durable. And, you know, for the sake of this matchup, I think his chin should hold up. You know, Gamrot, he's not really a heavy hitter by any means. He's primarily a grapp- grappler, I'd say. And, yeah, let's let's actually just get right into Gamrot. He's, uh, like I was saying, he's uh, very aggressive with his grappling, but his stand-up isn't anything to write home about it's you know it's decent it's serviceable but he's primarily just throwing his shots to set up his takedowns and you know he can definitely hang on the feet but you know his striking isn't going to be winning him the fights and uh, like I was saying before he doesn't have the most power he's more of like kind of I don't want to say pitter-patter shots but they're really just to, to kind of keep busy. Uh, I don't think his striking really gets the respect of his opponents. He doesn't do too much damage on the feet. Uh, but primarily, he's just looking to get the fight to the ground, look to control his opponents, and land a bit of ground and pound. Um, that seems to be his fight style. And he never really just puts a stamp on the fight. Like, even when he's on top controlling his opponents, he's just really winning the fight, you know, by optics, you know, uh, gaining control time. But he's not, like, hurting his opponents on the ground. He's not, like really uh uh doing anything serious there and i think that's kind of what lost him his last fight against kotetaladze who uh you know kotetaladze kudos to him you know he's a very strong guy was able to uh, defend the takedowns pretty well and consistently work his way back to his feet uh was really good at you know just exploding out of you know the bottom position uh shrimping out and on the feet he was just throwing the way more heavier shots and i, I don't disagree with the decision uh that uh could had a lot one uh he was doing he was he was you know by far the the more effective striker and the control time and damage that Mateus Gamrot did on the ground I don't think really you know uh really solidified the decision for him so uh, I'm not too upset with that decision even though I did actually have Gamrot in a in a parlay but uh I think something to also consider is that you know, uh, Gamrot, he's been fighting in a lot of these five rounds fights uh, in uh, at KSW where, you know, he's looking to conserve the gas tank a little bit. You don't want to go like balls to the wall, especially, you know, over the course of five rounds. And going into that three round fight, he was fighting with probably, you know, a five round mindset. So he wasn't really putting much behind his shots, uh, was probably, uh, you know, his body probably wasn't completely conditioned to a three round fight just yet. So uh, going into this fight, I think that if he you know sits down on his punches a little more, uh, looks to put his gas on the foot a little more, even on the ground, you know, lay you know just just put a bit more uh, strength in those shots. I think he can make a much bigger impact in the fight. But where it stands now, I think the line is a little wide. I think that uh, Gamrot. Well, I do favor him to win. I think that if Holtzman is able to keep it standing, uh, this could play out similarly to the Kateta Ladzi fight where. You know, he'll just be the one landing the heavier shots. And, um, yeah, he's got he's going to be the uh, uh, the stronger guy in this matchup, in my opinion. And uh, I think that with how good Gam- or, uh, Holtzman's takedown defense is and how good his get-ups are, I think Gamrot will have a, a tough time uh, taking and holding Holtzman down. And on the feet, I think that, uh, yeah, it'll be pretty close. I think that, you know, maybe Gamrot will have a slight volume advantage, but uh, Holtzman, he hits hard and he really loads up on his shot. So if it comes down to just the striking, I think that Holtzman will pull out ahead just because he'll be doing a bit more damage. So yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna side with Gamrot here because I do think that even though uh, Holtzman will come out a bit ahead in the striking exchanges, if uh, Gamrot is able to go to his wrestling and, you know, he's he'll chain wrestle. He's not going to give up after the first takedown. I think if he can keep it close with the striking and then just look to secure, you know, like maybe a minute or so of control time each round, he could definitely sway the judges in his favor. But I definitely do see a scenario where Holtzman is able to just keep the fight standing long enough and do enough damage on the feet to to steal a decision here. So uh, the pick here is Gamrot, but uh, I'm not super confident in it. And uh, I'm probably not going to look to bet uh, Gamrot here. Uh, if anything, I think the value side is Holtzman, maybe Holtzman by decision. Um, 
But yeah, the pick here is Gamrot, but uh, very low confidence. Jim Miller versus Joe Selecki, and Jim Miller is going to be the plus 190 underdog. Selecki, minus 225 favorite. And uh, this one's going to be pretty straightforward. Honestly, not too much to rate down here. Because with Jim Miller, at least as of late, he's pretty much uh, first round sub or bust. And, you know, if you kind of just flip through his most recent wins, uh, Roosevelt Roberts, round one armbar, Clay Guida, round one guillotine choke, uh, Jason Gonzalez, round one rear naked choke, uh, Alex White, uh, round one rear naked choke. And that was all the way back in uh, 2018. And then you'll have to go all the way back to 2016 before you find his uh, most recent win after that or before that. Um, but in all these other fights where he's not getting that round one submission, uh, he gets pretty soundly beat uh, afterwards. Uh, outside of that Oliveira fight where he does give up the rear naked choke early, uh, we saw in the Holtzman fight, first round, pretty competitive with uh, Jim Miller, but um, kind of fell off a cliff after that, you know, first round. Uh, output kind of waned, and uh, Holtzman was able to do, you know, a decent amount of damage on Miller in the second and third rounds. And then in uh, the Vince Pichel fight, we saw Miller, again, start off really strong, had Pichel's back, uh, I think, late in the third, or in, late in the first, and, you know... Th- had a dominant position there, but in the second and third round, um, well, actually in the, the beginning of the, the second round, we saw Miller start pretty strong there too, but uh, Pichel was able to stand up and eventually take Miller down and just have a pretty dominant second and third round uh, overall. And taking a look at Selecki, I mean, his stand-up, it's nothing to write home about, but he's primarily a grappler, grappler also. Uh, the last thing he'd want to do in this fight is just keep it a stand-up fight between him and Miller, because uh, if he does that, there, there might actually be a chance uh, Miller might steal this. Uh, Miller's boxing isn't terrible, it's actually decent. But uh, I think for uh, Selecki to win this, he's just going to have to go to his wrestling, uh, look to grapple, and... You know, I don't think he's going to get the submission on Miller. Uh, Selecki, he's a black belt, a uh, very high-level black belt in my opinion, and uh, um, very good at finding submissions, but, you know, Miller, very tough. Uh, but going back to this matchup, uh, I think that if Selecki is just able to control Miller outside of that first round, he's got a very good chance of just grinding out a decision here. Uh, like I said before, Selecki's got really high-level BJJ, so I think he'll be defensively sound that first round. I think he definitely can fend off the submission of Miller. And, um, you know, I, I think for Selecki to win, yeah, just just go to his grappling, look to wear on uh, Miller a bit because, you know, Miller at 38, having, you know, all these uh, complications from Lyman's disease, I believe, before, um, I, I just don't think his cardio is in a good place. And, you know, if uh, Selecki decides to go with a grapple-heavy game plan, he can just uh, wear out Jim Miller very quickly. Even if Jim Miller isn't, you know, going for the early submission, Selecki can definitely look to put on a heavy grappling pace and just uh, just outpace and outwork uh, Miller in the uh, the wrestling and the grappling. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Selecki here. But uh, the reason I'm not really betting him is because you know Miller, he is a veteran and you know he is dangerous in that first round. And I don't really know what kind of uh, game plan Selecki is gonna go in with. Uh, if he goes in with a grapple-heavy game plan, he can very easily coast to a, a decision, in my opinion. But if he decides to test his stand-up against Miller, and you know they have prolonged striking exchanges, I can see Miller potentially stealing a couple rounds. So uh, a little dicey for this fight, especially you know uh, Selecki. You know he's only ten and two. He's still a bit green. I do think he has all the tools to win, but I don't know if I want to lay you know minus two twenty-five on him uh, just yet. Uh, he might be decent parlay material. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be playing him straight. And, uh, you know, I think if you do want to play Jim Miller, you just uh, take him round one submission. And, uh, yeah, so the, the pick is Selecki. And uh, most likely no bet for this fight. Maybe a small sprinkle on uh, Miller first round submission. But I don't even think that's too likely. Selecki, he's, he's got really good defensive BJJ. So I don't think it's too likely unless he gets really, really sloppy. And the odds for that probably won't be crazy good since I think the the bookies will probably suspect that as well. So, uh, again, the pick is Selecki. And, uh, Daniel Rodriguez so versus Mike Perry. And uh, there's going to be a pretty good chance this one's going to be a banger. But uh, taking a look at the betting odds real quick, uh, Rodriguez is going to be the minus 180 favorite, and the comeback on Perry is plus 155. And uh, interestingly enough, both guys are actually coming off of a loss at 
to uh, UFC 255. But uh, taking a look at Rodriguez first, I mean, he's got really good boxing. He's got a great jab, good combination striking, and, you know, he's very good at mixing it up. He's got a really solid leg kick as well. Um, but overall, just a, a very slick boxer, in my opinion. He also has pretty good takedown defense, and we have seen him mix in a, a few takedowns as well, but, you know, primarily he is a striker. And uh, defensively, um, you know, he's decent, but, you know, he fights at a really high pace, has really high output, and that will inevitably leave some openings for opponents to capitalize on. So um, while he does absorb a lot of shots, he is actually pretty good at blocking and kind of parrying uh, a lot of uh, his opponents' uh, strikes. And uh, I do also want to point out he had a pretty uncharacteristic performance against Dalby where, you know, he didn't really throw as much as he usually would. I think it might have been because Dalby might have hurt him early and uh, led to him being a bit more tentative. But overall, uh, he didn't really put on a great performance and never really put a stamp on the fight like he usually does. Because in that fight, it was very close, very winnable. I mean, it wasn't a robbery by any means, but... Um, it was a close fight, and he had plenty of opportunities to potentially steal rounds and win the decision there, but uh, he never did that, and Dalby ended up stealing the decision win there. That being said, though, Rodriguez has looked pretty solid so far in the UFC. I mean, he's had some decent wins. I'd say his best win so far is uh, over Tim Means, but, you know, he showed pretty good striking overall in a lot of those fights and uh, showed really good toughness against Dwight Grant, where he was hurt early and was able to come back, but it looked like Grant might have uh, kind of blew his gas tank a little early that fight, and that let uh, Rodriguez essentially come back and eventually get the knockout uh, win on Dwight Grant. And taking a look at his opponent, Mike Perry, I mean, I guess we kind of know the deal with him. Uh, before, he used to be a bit of a brawler, likes to move forward, pressure opponents, and uh, like to exchange in the pocket. He's a, got pretty heavy hands and, uh, you know, pretty decent combination striking as well. But, um, you know, he is a bit hittable. And, you know, recently we have seen him go to his wrestling a bit more. In fact, I'd go as far as to say his wrestling has been really the bright spot uh, in his fights, his last two fights, actually. I'd say his grappling was what really solidified his win against Gall. And against Means, it was his uh, wrestling that really won him the first round. But it looked like he tired himself out doing that. And, uh, you know, that's going to be the issue with Perry here. I, I think that... You know, if he's got his training camp situation sorted out, you know, if he's putting in the work, I think this actually is a very winnable matchup for him. But we just don't know that with Perry. Like, before, he said he wasn't really doing any sort of sparring or anything, was mainly just hitting pads, didn't have a corner or anything. And, you know, it kind of showed in that Mickey Gall fight. Like, he should have destroyed Mickey Gall in that fight, but it was actually kind of competitive on the feet. And what really helped him pull away was his grappling, but... I'd say his striking has actually looked worse in his last two fights than it has ever. So, you know, while we have seen improvements in his grappling, we've seen a, a pretty significant decline in his striking, in my opinion. However, I think that these are all things that are extremely fixable if he's, you know, dedicated to training and is putting in the work, like in these training camps. Like, the cardio is definitely something he could work on, and the striking he could definitely tighten up as long as, you know, he's putting in the reps. But really, we just don't know if he's kind of dedicated himself, if he's found some new motivation to do that, or if he's just going to be eating cheeseburgers on, you know, fight week and missing weight again. He's just too much of a wild card right now. But assuming he is taking this seriously and has been putting in the work, I think how the fight would play out is he can keep it pretty competitive on the feet. Uh, I don't think that Rodriguez can totally outclass him. He definitely can touch up Perry, just because I think Perry is defensively, you know, not that great, but... You know, Perry's going to be landing some of his shots, too, and he's going to be landing them pretty hard. So uh, I think he could definitely hurt Rodriguez or at least keep it pretty competitive on the feet. And if his cardio has improved a bit, he can definitely mix in some of the wrestling to like to, at the end of the rounds to to win rounds that way. I can see him just approaching this fight like he did with Gall, you know, just uh, touch him up a bit on the feet. And then, you know, with uh, a minute and a half or two minutes left on the round, just look to get the takedown and secure some control time to steal the round. And uh, for that reason, I definitely feel that the fight is winnable for Perry, but it really just comes down to if, you know, he's been working this camp. But as far as a pick goes, I'm going to have to side with Rodriguez here just because Perry is going to have to prove to me he's really been putting in the work and he's been dedicating himself, you know, to the sport again. So uh, I'm going to side with Rodriguez here, but I'm not super confident because this is a really winnable fight for Perry. And, you know, as far as the bets go, I'm 
I'm not going to bet it yet, but if it looks like a ton of money is coming in on Rodriguez, or if I get any sort of indication that, you know, Perry's really been uh, going to work, I might just put half a unit on Perry. And, you know, if he gets to plus 200, I might just do half a unit anyways, because at that point, the line is just way too wide. And even an out of shape Perry, I think, can definitely win around and possibly steal another round off of Rodriguez. I think... Uh, Perry at this point is being a little bit disrespected. I understand that he, um, you know, is a bit wild and, uh, you know, he's not un very reliable at all, but, you know, he's fought some pretty high level guys, you know, he's beaten guys, or he's <laughs> fought guys like Jeff Neal and Vicente Luque and, you know, Oliveira and Donald Cerrone and Paul Felder. So, you know, he's fought some UFC mainstays, you know, top 10, top 15 guys, whereas Rodriguez, you know, he's really only you know, his really only good win was against Tim Means. So um, I think people might be overlooking Perry a little bit because of his most recent performances. But, you know, if, if he's been putting in work, like I've been saying this whole time, he could very easily win this fight. So I wouldn't really look to bet Rodriguez at minus 180 or anything. I think, if anything, this is a dog or pass situation, as crazy as it seems, because it is Mike Perry. But, yeah, I wouldn't really trust Rodriguez at minus 180 here. So, yeah, to wrap it up, the pick is... Uh, Rodriguez but very low confidence and you know if the line widens enough or if I get any sort of indication that you know Perry's been putting in work I might just put half a unit on Perry. Nina Ansarov versus Mackenzie Dern and uh, yeah this is a pick em fight minus 110 both ways and you know honestly not too much to break down here in my opinion. Uh, in regards to Dern's striking, I mean, it is a bit sloppy, um, but it does look like she's got pretty quick hands and decent pow power. Uh, she's a bit hittable defensively, though, and uh, obviously her, her strength is in her BJJ, but her wrestling just isn't that great. I mean, looking at her stats here, she's averages 0.28 takedowns uh, per 15 minutes and lands it at a whopping 5% accuracy. So I think she's going to have a hard time getting this fight to the ground unless she decides to, to pull guard or something. But um, more likely than not, I think this fight will largely stay standing. I think if the fight does get to the ground, it'll be because uh, Ansarov is looking for the takedown. But, you know, Ansarov herself, she doesn't really shoot any takedowns. And, you know, Ansarov's takedown defense is actually, you know, it's pretty good. So I think more often than not, this will play out on the feet and... You know, if the, the striking of Ansarov, I do favor her striking a little bit more. I think she's a little more technical, a little more accurate. And, uh, you know, defensively, she's uh, much more defensively sound than uh, Mackenzie Dern here. The only issue I see with her, though, is, you know, she is coming off a pretty long layoff and is coming off of a pregnancy. I believe she's given birth uh, just about a bit under five or six months ago so that is still pretty recent and you know at 35 i just don't know how she's gonna look after you know the pregnancy and the longish layoff but skill for skill i do favor Atsarov a bit more on the feet only thing is the the long layoff and it does look like dern has been improving her striking a bit uh, although, you know, the only time we've seen her in extended striking bouts was in her last fight against uh, Jean Jaroba, who, in my opinion, has awful striking. And, you know, I, I was looking back at that fight and I actually had Jean Jaroba that fight. I thought that if Jean Jaroba was able to get her takedowns, you know, work her top control and stay safe, she could have grinded her way to a uh, decision victory there. But I think she might have respected the BJJ of uh, Dern uh, a bit, so she decided to keep it standing, which I don't think was a good idea since Jandaroba has pretty awful striking herself. But in that fight, Dern did have uh, did show pretty good striking. Uh, that fight, uh, she, you know, she had quick hands, uh, was landing some good combinations, and uh, was throwing pretty heavy. So we might see an even more improved Dern in this fight, but, uh, you know, if... Ansarov didn't fall off too much. I think they could definitely keep it competitive on the feet. And uh, where it's lined now, I think it's pretty fair. I think, you know, if it stays standing, it'll be a pretty back and forth fight. However, if I did have to pick a side here, I would lean Dern since, you know, I think she's got the submission upside. If somehow the fight does find its way to the ground, I think that, you know, Dern will have a pretty sizable advantage there. But like I've been saying, if it's on the feet, I think uh, it'll be a tough one. It'll be a lot of back and forth. But uh, I'm going to side with Dern still because uh, I think that the long layoff for Ansarov, uh, it's, it's going to be, it's a bit concerning. And, you know, she might have a hard time finding her timing. And at 35, I think her speed has declined a bit. Even before her time off, she was looking a bit slower. 
and you know not as sharp so i'm gonna side with dern here but not super confident um so yeah i'm gonna pick dern here but as far as the bets go i'm not gonna be touching this fight i don't think it's just the long layoff is really concerning and the way the fight's going to play out, it's going to be really close and it's essentially going to be a coin flip. So I don't really see any value on either side. So from a betting perspective, I'm going to stay away from this fight. And uh, if I had to make a pick, I'm going to go with Dern, although I'm not really Sam Alvey versus it. Julian Marquez. And I believe Marquez is coming in short notice for this fight. Uh, but taking a look at the odds, Marquez is going to be the minus 175 favorite and the comeback on Alvey is plus 150 and uh, i feel that this is a pretty straightforward fight to break down uh, marquez you know he's primarily looking to just wing bombs in there he's got a ton of power uh but you know he gets really wild and is not super technical but you know at the end of the day he does have you know really heavy hands and if he is able to land clean he can definitely uh, get you out of there but uh defensively he is a bit hittable and uh like we saw in some of his previous fights against uh guys like you know, DeCarico and even Stewart, he was eating some massive uh, hooks in there and were taking, you know, it was taking a lot of damage, but was able to weather the storm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll give him that. He is extremely tough, but he is primarily a brawler. And his opponent, Alvi, uh, pretty one dimensional as well. He really just likes to swing those hooks, but uh, he's a bit more of a counter striker. He does look to, you know, land those hooks as his opponent is coming in. And, you know, that is essentially his game. You know, he'll do his thing where he's, you know, smiling at his opponent, waiting for them to get into the pocket. And as soon as he does that, he'll either look to swing that counter left or counter right. But taking a look at this matchup, and, you know, I'm probably going to get some shit here, but I'm going to side with Alvi. Marquez just did not look good at all against Pitolo. He was well on his way to losing a decision, but in typical Maki Pitolo fashion, he goes and chokes away that fight. But yeah, Marquez just did not look good there at all. He was kind of slow and still just as untechnical as ever. If he comes into that fight fighting like he usually does where, you know, he'll look to pressure Alvi, look to back him up and then unload on him, I think Alvi's going to catch him. He's going to play right into Alvi's hands in my opinion. And seeing how easy Marquez was being clipped by DeCarico when he was coming in, I don't see Alvi having any issue being able to land clean on Marquez. Uh, however, you know, I do think that Marquez is pretty durable and it's going to be tough getting him out of there. But, you know, once he starts eating a few shots from uh, uh, Alvi here, he might get a little more hesitant in the pocket and, you know, it's going to slow down the fight a bit. So, you know, even if Alvi isn't able to get Marquez out of there, I think he'll do enough damage to him to swing the rounds in his favor. And I know Alvi hasn't looked great in his last five fights. I mean, he is 0-4-1, but this is a pretty decent step down in competition for Alvi. And uh, we saw that when he does get a step down in competition in someone like Daun Jung, he was able to, uh, to beat him up pretty bad. And honestly, I think he should have won that fight. And I remember I actually had Jung in a parlay and I was happy to take the draw because it seemed like Alvi was just piecing him up on the feet. And looking at Marquez, I just don't know how he's such a big favorite here. Like, he's 8-2, and two, he's super green still, uh, not very technical. And, you know, he is coming off a, a pretty nasty, you know, career-altering uh, injury. Like, the only way I see Marquez really winning this fight is if he's able to catch Alvi and hurt him. And, you know, he very well could do that because, you know, Alvi, he got finished by a 42-year-old uh, Nogueira. But uh, if you do rewatch that fight, though, uh, Nogueira does actually land clean on the back of his head. So that probably wobbled his equilibrium a bit. And, you know, he wasn't completely out. He was going for that single leg. But, you know, the, the ref did wave it off. Uh, however, you know, I'm, I can overlook that a little bit since, you know, he... It was clean on the back of the head, and in his next fight, he did get knocked out by Krut, but again, that was a fight where he was, you know, on a single leg, and, uh, you know, he was working his way back up, so I don't want to discount the durability of Alvi too much, and, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just not really high on Marquez. I just don't see how he should be this big of a favorite, uh, you know? Yeah, he could get the knockout on Alvi, but I do think that Alvi could definitely catch Marquez, too, and I think that if... Neither fighter is able to catch each other, and it does go to a decision. I think it'll be a pretty close fight. I think that 
Both of them will land a, an equal amount of shots on each other, in which case I definitely feel that the side to be on is going to be on the Alvi side since he's a pretty decent sized underdog here. But yeah, I know it's not going to be a super popular opinion, but uh, yeah, I'm going to pick Alvi here. I think he's going to be able to catch Marquez coming in, especially with how sloppy Marquez is on the feet. Uh, I think he's very hittable. I, I think that Alvi has a good chance of hurting and possibly knocking out Marquez here. So the pick is Alvi, and uh, I haven't bet him yet, but I'm going to wait and see where these line moves because it looks like a, a ton of money is coming in on Marquez. So yeah, I'm going to hold off on that a little bit, see you know if it gets wider, I'll end up maybe putting a unit on Alvi and uh, maybe a quarter of a unit on Alvi by knockout. Cal Daukas versus Alias Cobb Kizriev. And uh, I have a feeling this is going to be a pretty exciting fight. But uh, taking a look at the betting odds real quick, we have uh, Kizriev at minus 135, and they come back on Daukas is plus 115. And uh, taking a look at Kizriev first, he's uh, he's a really heavy hitter, uh, really likes to blitz in, you know, to close the distance. And, you know, overall, he's just extremely aggressive whether or not, or whether, you know, it's on the feet or on the ground. And, you know, we saw in his fight against Truhan, he was able to just kick him right in the liver and... Uh, basically end the fight in 28 seconds there. I mean, he does not play around in there at all. He's always looking to hurt opponents, you know, whether it's on the feet or on the ground. And, you know, on the feet, his striking isn't super technical, but he's got a lot of power. And uh, I really think that his ground game, though, is, you know, where uh, his best work is done. He's got strong top control, uh, very heavy ground and pound. But, you know, the only issue that I have with him is he hasn't really been fighting the highest level of opponents. Uh, if you kind of go through his records, a lot of these guys are still pretty green. And if you look at some of the other guys who do have better records, they're a bit older and they're, you know, a bit of a can crusher themselves too. So um, he hasn't really been tested. And a lot of these fights, he's usually the, the one moving forward. He's the one pressuring. He's the one, you know, dealing more of the damage. Uh, he hasn't really faced an opponent that's able to put him in danger or really fight back or threaten him. I also think his cardio is a little bit suspect. I don't think it's terrible by any means, but I have seen him start to slow down a bit uh, later in the fight. But to his credit though, uh, it was a pretty grappling heavy match and you know, it was a pretty high paced grappling match. So by the third time was rolling around, he started to slow down a bit. Um, you know, he wasn't like super gassed out, but you know, he did start to see that his movement was a little bit more labored and well, he did end up getting a takedown later in the round. He wasn't able to hold his opponent down for too long. So yeah, that's definitely something to keep an eye out for, especially since Kizriev hasn't really gone past the first round too much. I mean, he has a few like decision wins, but um, a lot of his fights end pretty early in the first round. So uh, he hasn't accumulated too much cage time and it's been against pretty low level opponents too. So this will be a decent step up in competition. Uh, and you know, We'll see him get tested beyond the first round in a really tough opponent in Daukas. And taking a look at his opponent in Daukas, I am actually pretty high on him. Uh, this might be a, a bit of a hot take, but I think he's actually the, the better Daukas brother. But since the heavyweight division is so shallow, uh, somehow, you know, uh, his brother, I think Chris, is going to be ranked. So uh, I digress, though. I, I think that overall his uh, skill set, or Kyle Daukas's skill set, is, you know, he's very well-rounded. He's got good... You know, Chris Boxing, very accurate. He's got good combination striking, and, you know, he's got great takedown defense as well. Um, and then he's got a solid clinch game, good clinch elbows and knees, and a pretty well-rounded uh, top or offensive grappling game overall. Like, uh, he's got decent takedowns and some pretty good top control as well, and, you know, he's got a really good submission game. So overall, I actually give an advantage to Daukas pretty much everywhere the fight goes whether it's, you know, on the feet or on the ground. And as far as level of competition goes, I'd give a slight advantage to Daukas as well. I mean, he hasn't been fighting super high-level opponents, but he did give a really good account of himself against Brendan Allen, who I believe is a really solid prospect and is definitely UFC caliber. And, you know, looking at that fight, I you know actually had a little bit on uh, Daukas there in that fight. He was a massive underdog, and he gave a really good account of himself. I think... Uh, you know, he got he got need early in that fight, and um, I think that really kind of set the tone for that fight, but he was able to recover and actually reverse positions and eventually take Allen's back, too. I mean, it was a very competitive fight, I'd say, outside of that 
first like two or three minutes where Allen was able to land clean on him. But outside of that, in the grappling exchanges, Dacus was holding his own and was able to reverse positions uh, quite a few times. And on the feet, I actually gave him the advantage there. He was actually doing pretty good touching up uh, Allen. And something I do want to add is his cardio and toughness seemed to hold up. Like he was taking a lot of damage, but going into that third round in a very grappling heavy fight, he was able to get a takedown on Allen and take his back and was able to do a bit of damage. Uh, so I think his cardio and his toughness checks out. So this is going to be a pretty tough fight for Kizriev. But taking a look at this matchup, again, I do favor uh, Daukus a bit more on the feet. I think he's going to be the taller fighter. He'll have the reach advantage, and he'll be the more technical fighter too. So he can definitely stay on the outside and pick Kizriev apart. But if Kizriev decides to close the distance and look to grapple, I think he'll have a hard time taking Daukus down because Daukus is, you know, he's got really good takedown defense. He's good at digging the underhooks, and, uh, you know, he does attack the guillotine sometimes, which I don't really like since, you know, you're given that position, but he's got a really dangerous submission game, so, you know, that is something that I can overlook a little bit, but uh, Daukus, he's also got really good get-ups, too. Like, we've seen time and time again, he was able to get up, you know, when Allen was taking him down, when Stoltzfus was taking him down, and he was able to reverse positions in a lot of those fights, too. So for this fight, I'm picking Allen. I think that he has a lot more paths to victory, and I just don't really see too clear of a path to a victory for Kizriev here. I mean, I don't think he'll be able to get the knockout. He is a heavy hitter, but Dacus, he's really tough, and Kizriev isn't exactly like an explosive power puncher or anything. And maybe he's able to get significant uh, top control time, but I just don't really see it. I, I see him having a really tough time getting Dacus down and even holding him down, so... I, I favor Daukus really everywhere the fight goes. And from a betting perspective, I've already put two units on Daukus at plus 115. I just don't see how Kizriev should be, is the favorite here. He actually opened as an even bigger favorite, but the line's been bet down uh, significantly since. And, you know, I, I agree with the action there because I really think that Daukus should actually be the one that's favored here. And, um, by the time this podcast comes out, I have a feeling the line is going to flip. So I've already put two units on Daukus at plus 115, and I have a feeling the money is going to continue to come in on Daukus. And something else I'm also looking at is Daukus round two or round three submission. I think that with uh, the high pace grappling that fight that they'll have, I think Kizriev will slow down. And, you know, with the long, lanky arms of Daukus, I think he is primed to lock in a Dars or a Guillotine in the second or third round as uh, Kizriev starts to slow down a bit and maybe get a little sloppy with his takedown entries, leaving his neck exposed for uh, Daukus to lock in that guillotine or the uh, Darus, like I said before. So I think Daukus might be able to get a submission take or a submission uh, finish in the second or third round, but I think more often than not, he will get the win by decision. But I think he definitely is live for the decision later in the fight. So to recap, I am picking Daukus here, and I do have two units uh, bet on him already at plus 115, and I will be looking at the round two, round three submission props. Arnold Allen versus Sodik Yusuf, and wow, this is a really compelling matchup, a great matchup between two prospects here. And, you know, I really like how the UFC does this. I think it's great that they're putting these guys up against each other early in their career. I think it's great for development. I think it's great for competition. And I think it's great for the fans because you get a really good matchup here. But taking a look at the betting odds here, uh, Yusuf is going to be the minus 126 favorite and the comeback on Allen is going to be plus 106. So pretty close to being pick em odds here, which you know I do agree with. I think this is a really close fight on paper at least. So diving right into it, let's take a look at Allen first. Um, so Allen, he's a pretty good striker in my opinion. He's very accurate, very composed. Uh, he'll pick his shots and kind of explode in. He's got good combination striking as well. And, uh, you know, he will rip to the body. He's got a good jab, uh, really good, you know, body and leg kick that he likes to throw. Um, he's very light on the feet as well. And, you know, he's got really solid defense. He keeps his hands up and uh, does a decent job of keeping his head off the center line. And as far as the grappling goes... Uh, offensively, he will occasionally mix in the takedown, uh, and, you know, he's got good takedown defense as well. Uh, you kind of expect that from, you know, someone coming out of TriStar. Very uh, well-rounded, you know, good striking, but, yeah, overall very, very well-rounded. So I really don't have too many bad things to say about him. 
Uh, the only knock, I guess, that I would have on him is the level of competition. And even that, I don't think his you know, level of competition is that bad. He's beating vets like Melendez and Lentz like you know, a good prospect should. But at the same time, you know, they're not really posing too much of a challenge to him. He hasn't really been tested against these guys. Like, you know, he was, I'd say, coasting pretty hard in most of his fights. He's also got a decent win against uh, Jordan Rinaldi and uh, Makwan Armarkani a few years back. But, you know, overall, though, I don't think he's fought too high level of competition. Whereas, you know, for Yusuf, I believe he's fought the better opponents in uh, Benitez and Philly who uh, are... You know, I'd say like solid UFC level uh, fighters. But yeah, taking a look at Yusuf though, uh, he's a really good pressure fighter. Uh, he has a really heavy overhand right that he has. Um, not too much head movement though, but uh, again, really good pressure and decent counter punching as well. Um, his punches though, uh, not very tight, uh, a bit loopy, but again, the, the power is a bit of an equalizer there. So, you know, his uh, exchanges get a little wild, but you know, he's got really good toughness and you know, we have seen him dropped and hurt before, but his uh, recovery is really good. Like uh, we saw in the Benitez game or the Benitez fight, he ate a kick and I think he got dropped, but, you know, was able to come back that fight and eventually get the knockout. He also was eating a ton of leg kicks from Benitez. And uh, we know that Benitez throws those heavy, heavy leg kicks and it didn't really look like it phased Yusuf at all. So, you know, I got to give it to him when it comes to the toughness and, you know, his ability to recover. So, you know, Allen's going to have a hard time, you know, getting him out of there. But uh, that's not to say that Allen can't. It's just that, you know, he's gonna, it's going to be tough, especially when, you know, Yusuf is going to be throwing bombs back at him. And, you know, that's not to say that Yusuf isn't a very technical fighter or anything. I think he is. He is good with his striking. It's just I don't think it's, it's as polished as Allen. I think Allen is a bit more technical on the feet. But, uh, you know, with the power that Yusuf has, I think he can get away with it a little bit because, you know, a lot of the, his opponents... When they feel that right hand land, they start to respect him a bit. You know, they uh, they get a lot more tentative and, you know, they start to be a little more gun shy because, uh, again, that power of uh, Yusuf is uh, no joke. But taking a look at this matchup, I think it'll play out pretty closely. Both guys, you know, when it comes to their output is pretty similar. Yusuf does throw a bit more, but he's also a bit more hittable. He also does seem to stand a bit heavy on his lead leg. And uh, this is going to be a, uh, a Southpaw versus Orthodox matchup. So uh, Allen is going to have plenty of opportunities to kick at the legs of Yusuf and even go for those body kicks. And I think that's going to be really crucial in this fight, especially as the fight starts to get into the later rounds. I don't think that Yusuf has bad cardio or anything, but he does seem to slow down a bit as the fight, you know, progresses. And if... You know, Allen is able to go to the body, you know, kick to the body and jab at the body and work, you know, work those uh, leg kicks. He'll, uh, it'll pay dividends, you know, later in the fight, you know, because a lot of the fights that Yusuf has had, you know, he's the one who's pressuring and he's the one moving forward. Uh, he hasn't been met with too much resistance. Uh, I think that, you know, going against someone like Allen where, you know, he is going to return fire. He is going to stay defensively sound. It's going to push Yusuf a lot more than he has in a lot of his previous fights. So if Allen is able to stay defensively responsible, he could give uh, Yusuf a lot of trouble in the later rounds. But like I said earlier, though, Allen also hasn't really been tested either. And uh, going against Yusuf, you know, he's going to be eating some some hard shots from him. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a tough matchup for both guys. I'd say they're toughest to date. And this could potentially be a war. But yeah, this is a pretty tough fight to call. But if I had to pick a side, I'm going to lean more towards Allen here. I think he's the more technical striker, and while I don't think that Yusuf is necessarily KO or bust, he does rely on landing that, you know, clean right to really do some damage and, uh, you know, either get the knockout or look to swing rounds by landing clean. So I think that if Allen is able to, you know, avoid the power shots of Yusuf, he'll likely be the one landing the more effective shots over the course of three rounds, but... Again, uh, I'm not super confident in this because, again, Yusuf, you know, he has, you know, some game-changing power. And at the end of the day, I don't think he's, like, super bad technically or anything. I just think that Allen just slightly edges it out with his, uh, you know, technical advantage, but not by a wide margin by any means. So, yeah, as far as a pick goes, I'm going to go with Allen. Uh, not super confident, but, you know, as far as, you know, the betting tips go, I, uh, I'm i looking at potentially a small bet on 
Alan, if the lines start to widen a bit, I know it does look like a lot of money or a good amount of money is coming in on uh, Yusuf here. And if I can get like plus 125 or 130 or maybe even more, I might take a small stab on Allen here. But this is going to be a pretty close fight and a pretty fun one. So who knows? I might just pass on it. Uh, but we'll see. Anyways, uh, pick is Allen and uh, might put a unit on him if the line Marvin gets Vittori wide versus Kevin Holland. And uh, obviously, you know, Vittori was scheduled to fight Till here, but Till got injured and Holland is coming in short notice for this fight. And, uh, you know, honestly, I was a lot more interested in, uh, you know, Vittori versus Till. Uh, I, I just felt it's a much more compelling matchup, even though Till, you know, he isn't the most exciting fighter. But I was interested to see how he was going to match up against Vittori. And really, I was just curious to see how the rest of the division is going to shake out. But, um, I mean, this isn't a bad matchup, but you know, I'd much rather have seen the other matchup here. So uh, taking a look at Vittori first, uh, or actually, let's take a look at the odds first. It's pretty crazy here. So uh, uh, Kevin Holland, he's going to be a uh, plus 250 underdog. And uh, Vittori, you can get him for minus 325. And uh, yeah, let's start with Vittori. So, um, you know, he's a pretty pressure-heavy fighter. Uh, you know, his punches, they are a bit loopy, not very tight. But uh, again, he is very aggressive and, you know, is pretty good at putting combinations together. Um you know, what I did notice was he's not as good on the back foot. Uh, obviously, you know, he does his best work when he's the one moving forward, you know, backing his opponents up against the fence. And, you know, as far as his grappling goes, he's uh, got pretty solid defensive grappling and uh, pretty solid, you know, offensive grappling as well. He does have a, a nice little single leg that he likes to, to use, uh, you know, drive his opponents to the fence and look to get his takedowns there. Um, and then on the ground, he does have, you know, decent top control, BJJ, um, you know, overall, he's just a very well-rounded fighter, in my opinion. I'd say, uh, you know, I don't think he's elite quite yet. I don't think he's really got any elite skill sets, but uh, he's very well-rounded overall. And I think he's going to be a mainstay in the division, probably a very solid, you know, top 10 gatekeeper type of guy, maybe even top five at some point. But, you know, I just don't think he's got uh, an elite skill or elite uh, anywhere that could really take him to the top win him a championship but uh i think that you know he's going to be really really solid for years to come and uh, who knows he's only 27 still very young in his career he could be making some pretty big improvements but as of right now i don't think he's got what it takes to be championship level just yet not that it matters for this matchup i think that you know i think he should win this matchup um but yeah going back to this uh this fight here uh, taking a look at Kevin Holland and, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we all know what, what the deal is with him coming off of a really uh, disappointing and honestly just embarrassing performance. And, you know, I'll be honest, I did put a couple units on him and, uh, that was a really, really disappointing showing. He, you know, I, the, the striking is there, but his fight IQ, his attitude, and really the defensive grappling is just lacks much to be desired. And, uh, you know, I completely agree with where the line is. You know, before the line even came out, I, I kind of had a feeling that Vittori, you know, he's going to be around like minus 250, minus 300. And it would be it would be totally justified just because uh, of the, the, the awful showing that he had against Brunson. But, you know, I'll try to avoid as much recency bias as I can and, you know, just bias in general because, you know, I did put a bit of money on him before. But, you know, from a, you know, striking perspective, I think that Holland, I think he is the better striker here. I think that, you know, if he's the one moving forward, he can have a lot of success. But, you know, Vittori, he's not going to be the kind of guy that's just going to back up. You know, he's going to he's going to he's going to look to want to dictate the pace himself and look to pressure Holland. And, um, yeah, I think in prolonged striking exchanges, I think Holland will come out ahead. But obviously the, you know, the uh, the big thing with Holland is, you know, he's got really terrible takedown defense and the path of least resistance for Vittori is just to look to clinch up with Holland and just take him down. And with the lack of urgency that Holland really showed in that fight, uh, I have a hard time seeing him putting on a good showing this fight and, uh, you know, winning this fight, essentially. And, you know, coming off of, you know, just that humiliating loss, it's, you know, I don't think three weeks is enough for him to really shore up his game enough to um, to the point where he's able to keep a fight standing long enough for him to win. Uh, even if he has changed his mindset, I don't think three weeks is enough for him to really improve his skill set. That being said, though, I think there are certainly tweaks to his game he can make to make this a, a bit more of a competitive fight. And, you know, for one, you know, he was really overextending in a lot of his shots. He was, you know, uh, 
uh, over committing with a lot of his combinations against Brunson and every every time he landed a bit on Brunson he would kind of just jump in there and kind of look to get the finish uh, and I understand why he was uh, he was losing on you know a lot of those rounds and he wanted to maybe just look for the KO there because that was his only path to victory but he could definitely have been a, a bit more composed in there I think he could look to pick his shots a little better um, look to just stick and move against Brunson I think he would have had a bit more success but uh, at the end of the day, you know, Brunson, high-level wrestler who was able to take him down and control him. But, you know, I don't think that Vittori is quite at that level. He's got solid grappling and solid top control. But I do think that, you know, uh, Brunson, he's the much more seasoned, much more experienced veteran in there. So, he, you know, I think that Vittori definitely will have some success with the grappling, but maybe not quite to the level that Brunson has had. Uh, that said, though, I think that is a pretty, pretty clear path to victory for Vittori. So yeah, you know, I'm going to go with Vittori here. Uh, something that I think doesn't get mentioned enough is just the durability on Vittori, man. This guy is cast iron. Uh, I don't think that Holland is going to be knocking Vittori out. And um, yeah, I think the only way Holland is going to be able to win this is if he's able to just stay on the outside and really just kick at Vittori, use his length, you know, work the teep, work the jab, throw a few one-twos in there, uh, really just maintain the distance and not look not let Vittori take him down. But I don't think that's too likely. I think eventually Vittori is going to be able to close the distance, get his hands on Holland, and eventually take him down. Grind him out for a decision. So yeah, the pick here is Vittori. And, you know, I'd say he's a pretty safe bet, even at like minus 300. Um, it's just that I think that Holland, he's going to have to play a pretty perfect game. And, uh, you know, obviously he's got the knockout upside. Anyone can knock anyone out in this game. But, you know, unless he lands clean on uh, Vittori, I think he's going to have a pretty hard time this fight. Uh, so, yeah, I think Vittori, pretty safe bet. Pretty safe to parlay, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be taking a shot here. I already have a number of bets locked in already that I like. So, uh, yeah, the pick here is Vittori. And uh, I think he wins a pretty comfortable and decision. And that'll here. do it for another installment of this podcast. Uh, let me know what you guys think about it. Uh, let me know if you guys agree or disagree with some of these picks. And uh, just let me get some of your guys' feedback. Because, uh, you know, I do actually read the comments here. And uh, I do listen to a ton of the other, you know, more popular, you know, cappers out there. And so, you know, I will change my mind if there are compelling enough arguments for, you know, a certain fighter or a certain matchup. I do actually enjoy hearing, uh, you know, insights on the other side. And uh, someone did mention that there were some audio issues uh, with the previous uh, podcast. And... Uh, when I listen to it, it sounds okay to me, so it's kind of hard to tell on my end. But uh, you know, if, there, if this is an issue that keeps coming up, just let me know. I'll try my best to fix it. But you know, at the end of the day, it's a this is a pretty low production podcast. Uh, just some dude doing a podcast out of his grandma's basement. So yeah, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I'm not super tech savvy or anything. So I'll try my best. Uh, but no promises or anything. And uh, as far as the bets go, I know I say I'm going to bet on a lot of things or not going to bet on a lot of things. But like I was saying before, you know, I am prone to change my mind on, you know, certain fights. And what I do actually bet on, I will post onto my Bet MMA Tips page. And hopefully we can start putting together a little win streak here. Um, but yeah, that'll do it for this episode. Uh, thank you guys for listening and I'll uh, catch you guys next time.